Greetings, welcome to our worship. Van Dickens here, pastor of the Monroe United Methodist Church. Today is the sixth Sunday after the Epiphany on the church calendar. It's a Sunday like many others in that we always focus on Christ. As we know, tomorrow is Valentine's Day, named after one of the early Christian martyrs, so our theme is love. Many facets to love. Two Sundays ago, we read from 1 Corinthians 13, Paul's love chapter. Today, we hear about love from the words of Jesus. Let's begin our worship. God of our hearts, here we are. We've come with thirsty hearts, praying that your word will satisfy us. We come with aching hearts, praying for good news to comfort us. We come with overflowing hearts, praying for a chance to share your love. You who know our hearts and hear our prayers, be with us now in this hour of worship. In our gathering and in the love that surrounds us, give us grateful hearts, joyful hearts, open to the love that comes from the one after your own heart, Christ Jesus, your Son. For it is in his name and with loving hearts that we pray. Amen. Foley at Pierpoint wrote a wonderful song that's found in our hymnal. It speaks of the love that greets us at our birth, the love of God that made creation, the love we share with one another, the love we share as the church, the love of Christ. Love we receive in many ways. For the beauty of the earth. For the beauty of the earth, for the glory of the skies, for the love which from our birth over and around us lies. Lord of all, to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. For the beauty of each hour, of the day and of the night, hill and vale and tree and flower, sun and moon and stars of light. Lord of all, to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. For the joy of ear and eye, for the heart and mind's delight, for the mystic harmony, linking sins to sound and sight. Lord of all, to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. For the joy of human love, brother, sister, parent, child, friends on earth and friends above, for all gentle thoughts and mild. Lord of all, to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. For thy church that evermore lifted holy hands above, offering upon every shore her pure sacrifice of love. Lord of all, to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. For thyself, best gift divine, to the world so freely given, for that great, great love of thine, peace on earth and joy in heaven. Christ our God, to thee we raise this our sacrifice of praise. What a beautiful song. Well, scripture for today is found in the gospel according to John, chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. Hear these words of our Lord. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Each year during the season of Lent, 
on Monday, Thursday of Holy Week, one of our best friends gives us a call. Barbara was a member of a couple of the churches that I served many years ago. Every year, she asks the same question, knowing we have the answer. It's become a tradition. The question is, what does Monday, Thursday mean? And faithfully, I will tell her, well, Monday, which is not to be confused with Monday, is the Latin word for mandatum, or mandate, and another word for that is commandment. And just to be perfectly clear, another word for that is an order. It was the night of his last supper. Jesus took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and washed his disciples' feet, all 12, including Judas Iscariot. Judas then left and betrayed his Lord, after which Jesus turned to the 11 remaining disciples and gave them what we know today as the only commandment during his public ministry, shortly before his death, the only order that he gave to them, the only time he gave them what we refer to as a mandate. What happened after this happened quickly. He was arrested, tried, flogged, and crucified. But not before he gave them a new commandment, a new order, that they love one another as he has loved them. When I was in the Navy, yes, another Navy story. When I was in the Navy in 1996, I was assigned to the Marines, 3rd Battalion, 2nd Marines, Infantry. We were deployed to Okinawa and South Korea for six months of intensive jungle and mountain war skills training. Lots of fun, highly recommended. While there, Van Dickens decides to <clears throat> grow a mustache. You can picture that. I was away from my wife, Kathy, so I knew she wouldn't be around to offer her comments on the matter, so I decided, hey, it's now or never. First three or four days, nobody noticed the stubble growing on my upper lip. For that matter, neither did I. After the first week, still no one could tell any difference. It took two weeks before there was enough peach fuzz to thicken up before anybody noticed, including me. Finally, after two weeks, it was evident there was something growing there. My macho mustache was slowly coming into being. Hooray for me. Well, most teenage boys enjoy this opportunity much earlier than I did. I was a late bloomer when it came to facial hair, but I had a mustache now, at least the beginnings of one. And I thought, hmm, I'm on my way. Military won't let you grow a beard, but it'll allow a mustache if it's properly trimmed and, and all. It's, it's authorized. I could do this. So I did. Next day, I was walking by my battalion commander. He looked at me. And he looked at me again. And he said, Chaplain, what's that on your lip? And I thought, well, surely he knows what a mustache is. Gave me a funny feeling with his question. So I told him, well, sir, it's, it's a mustache. And he started grinning. And I grinned and he walked up to me, smiling, and said, cut it off. I said, sir, because I, I knew I, I was within regulations. A, a modest mustache is, is, is authorized. It was, it, it was okay. I was within standards. It's, and that's why I said, sir. And that's when he stopped smiling. And with a straight face, a stone face, he said, cut it off. Now. I said, aye, aye, sir. And friends, that was it. <laughs> Two weeks of fuzzy growth, and that was it. Ten minutes later, it was gone. Later that day, the battalion commander walked by me again and said, much better, chaplain. And I saluted smartly and carried on. <sighs> there are times when a person offers you a helpful suggestion. There are times when someone gives you their opinion. There are times when someone will make a recommendation. There are even times when you may be warned, but when you are given an order a command to do something, there's no doubt what you should do if the person giving the command has the authority over you. And he certainly did. He was my superior officer. I was under orders to follow his orders. In this case, he decided my mustache was not in the best interests of the military. Well, having washed their feet, an act of humility, which his disciples awkwardly allowed him to do. Having washed their feet, he then speaks to them as the Messiah, as their Lord, and orders them to love one another as he has loved them. Only order he gave. And, I might add, therefore, the most important. 
love each other. Sometimes you and I miss the incredibly, exceptionally, unbelievably, phenomenally, bewilderingly radical nature of this command because on the one hand, it sounds like a very natural thing. Love each other. Love, love, love. Even the Beatles sing it. All you need is love. Lum da 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 da. Coming from Jesus, that's all he taught. Love, love your enemies, love your neighbors. Do good to your neighbors, do good to your enemies. No big surprise in that he, was, that he would then tell his disciples, love each other. Sounds as natural as apple pie. Friday night football. If anyone is going to talk about love, it, it would be Jesus, right? It only makes sense for him to tell his disciples to love. Are we missing something? He tells his 11 disciples, whom he affectionately calls little children, a pet name, the way we say dear ones. He says, little children, I'm with you for just a little while longer, so I leave you with one last word. It's not a suggestion. It's not a request, not a recommendation. It's an order from me to you, a commandment. Love each other, a new commandment. Love each other the way I love you. What does it mean to love each other the way he loves us? It sounds so simple. Love each other. But wait, love each other as I have loved you. Ah, there it is. How do we love this way, his way? Through humble service, the way a servant gets down on hands and knees and washes your feet? Yes. By the way, you give everything you are and everything you have freely without hesitation? Yes. By the way, you set the example day in and day out through your patience and kindness, even in the face of hostility? Yes. By your willingness to forgive after you've been insulted time and again? Yes. By speaking the truth, not defensively, not to get back at the other person, but in love and with a heart of peace, always, yes. By loving regardless of whether or not it is reciprocated, yes. To be fair with each other, to be gracious after you blew it, after the other person blew it the day before by those terrible things said and done, yes. By not piling on top of you, of the other person, that endless laundry list of past mistakes, yes. By committing myself to loving you, to doing good to you when you're not all that lovely or when I just don't feel like it, yes. Even when it's risky, even when there are consequences, yes. It is loving without limits, without conditions, without boundaries. It is grace. When Jesus gave this order, he was speaking to his disciples. It was an order for them. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. He wasn't talking about their love for the world. He wasn't talking about love thy neighbor as thyself, those neighbors who are out there. He'll say that in other places at other times. But here, he wasn't even talking about loving their enemies, and Lord knows they would have plenty. He's talking about loving each other. Those who are within and among the faith community, fellow disciples, beginning with the 11 who remained with Jesus after Judas left. If we've not figured that out yet, it, it's sounding personal. He's talking to us today about us as a fellowship. We might say, well, of course we love each other. This is our church, our fellowship. Of course we love each other. How about every day? How about when we see true colors come out in each other? Day after day, among the very people we know best and with whom we are in ministry together? When you think about it, there's nothing easy about keeping the commandment to love one another in the church. It's hard enough to love your family members every day. Loving everyone in the church the way Christ loves us, you do that, your heart just might get bruised. Considering how many times the Church of Jesus Christ has split over one falling out after another, history attests that this love ethic, this order by Christ to his disciples, which is today us, is far from easy. But if you do, he says, if you do love as I love each other, the world will know you because of it. Furthermore, they will know whose 
you are. Now take notice. Valentine was, the, uh, that is the original Valentine, was a member of the clergy who lived in the third century under the Roman Empire before Christianity was accepted. Arrested for sharing his faith, it is said that he healed the blind daughter of the judge who had arrested him. Upon giving his daughter her eyesight by praying for her, the judge was converted to Christianity and was baptized along with 40 members of his household, including his now healed daughter. The judge also freed all the Christians under his arrest since they were now part of his new, brand new Christian community. Valentine was later arrested again along with other Christians for sharing his faith, this time by the Roman emperor himself. When Valentine witnessed his faith to Claudius II, the emperor, Claudius condemned him to death. It is said that shortly before his execution on February the 14th, 269 AD, he wrote a note to the judge's daughter whose eyes he had healed, and he signed it, from your Valentine. And so today we send Valentines. If you were curious about how Valentine's Day began, now you know. Here in our church, we have expanded it to a year-long practice where we send love cards for birthdays, anniversaries, sympathy cards, and for no good reason other than we simply love you. Valentine, early Christian martyr who willingly and daily obeyed the command to love among and within the community of believers, even if it meant suffering with them. God's love, the grace of Christ, calls us to love as he loved, beginning with in the fellowship, even if identifying with them comes at a cost. In the words of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, loving as Christ loved is costly because it calls us to follow, and it is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it costs a man his life, and it is grace because it gives a man the only true life. It is costly because it condemns sin and grace because it justifies the sinner. Reverend Bonhoeffer spent the remaining year and a half of his life in a Nazi prison camp in solidarity with a very special community who knew what it meant to suffer as Christ suffered. He was executed for his love for them days before the prison was liberated. Bonhoeffer, a modern day martyr, whose writings influenced countless other Christians, including Martin Luther King Jr. and the whole civil rights movement. Love that is willing to suffer within a community that is also suffering. Is that what it means to love each other as Christ loved us? Yes, sometimes. Few, if any of us, will ever be martyred, I think, in obedience to the order that Christ gives. Few of us can imagine a congregation faithfully loving each other while standing in the middle of a coliseum waiting for the lions. But most of us, loving each other the way Christ loves us is something that happens in the middle of ordinary living. The willingness to come together, to rub elbows with each other, to be civil, to be respectful, patient and kind and forgiving, day after day after day after day, day in and day out. Every day of our lives as we grow up, grow old, and grow in grace. Some days that's easy. Other days, well, it is what it is. Sometimes we do a right decent job of loving each other as Christ loves us, don't we? And when we do, our witness is like a beacon that shines clear around the world, can influence an entire community that knows us by that love. Other days, it, it can be harder. Someone once said, in some ways, it's a lot easier to love one's enemies. You don't have to deal with them every day. But you and I are, well, as communities of faith, as fellow disciples, I guess in a way you can say we're stuck with each other. For myself, it's like the words of Huey Lewis in the news. Yes, it's true. I'm so happy to be stuck with you. But loving as Christ loved us is not always easy. 
It doesn't come naturally. It means loving through all the ups and downs, the hardships and failures, the misunderstandings, and yes, at times, sharp disagreements coming together and working together with people who are different, so different than ourselves. When Jesus gave his commandment only moments before, he was reclining at the table when Judas, one of his disciples, left to betray him. One of their own, who was called into ministry, like all the rest of them, to enjoy the blessings of the kingdom. He left and sold Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. Jesus and his disciples, therefore, had no illusions as to how hard it is to love each other consistently, faithfully. Betrayal, denial, broken promises, the many ways the church diminishes its witness to the love of Christ by its failure to love each other as fellow pilgrims. Knowing that they either fly high or crash and burn on this one principle, he tells them, no, he orders them, love each other the way he has loved them. Note that he said, just as I have loved you. With the cross before him, he speaks in the past tense, as I have loved you. There was no question in the minds of his disciples that he loved them. They had no idea how much. They would soon. So here's the question for today. Did they? Did they keep that one commandment, that one order? Did they love each other the way he loved them? Not at first. Not at first. Jesus was arrested by Judas while the rest of the disciples ran away when the going got rough. Peter denied even being a disciple. Not a good beginning. But the Lord knew the stuff of which they were made and what God can do with feet made out of clay. It was too late for Judas, but not for the rest. Mary Magdalene was the first to realize that love, his love, had no bounds, has no bounds. She was the first to see him alive. And then John, the beloved disciple, then Peter, and then all the others saw and believed. It's true. There are no limits to his love. Death cannot stop it. So later on Pentecost, so filled with the good news, that love never ends, that that same love filled them up. And were filled with the Holy Spirit of grace and love and declared it to the world. But that did not fall on deaf ears. 3,000 people gave their lives to Christ that day. 3,000 souls decided to be one of his disciples and carry out the order to love each other. First 12, then 11, then 12 again, together with a small community of 120, jumping up to 3,000 on Pentecost. After that, it was one new congregation after another as they spread the good news to the known world and met and worshipped and devoted the rest of their lives to obeying the one order Jesus had. Love each other. Did they follow the order all the time? Not exactly. There were divisions almost immediately. Paul had sharp disagreements with Peter, Barnabas, Mark. And within the church, between Gentile and Jewish Christians, rich and poor, between tongue speakers and non-tongue speakers, over right theology and over which Christian body has ultimate authority, divisions, schisms, all the way to the present day. But the command is always there. Love each other as I have loved you. All of us have been through times in the church, wherever you attend, either here or in other congregations when we have not lived up to the commandment of Jesus. It's why one of the confessions we sometimes pray that is printed in our hymnal here on page 12 in the Methodist hymnal is, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have rebelled against your love. It happens in every church, in big ways and little ways. When we fail in little ways, Somebody knows. When we fail in big ways, it seems like the whole world knows. But when we get it right, 
When we truly love as Christ loved, the world knows that too. Makes you feel all clean and good inside. Gives you hope. Of course, no church is perfect. It's filled with imperfect people, but it was to imperfect people that Jesus gave the commandment. Very briefly, I want to share with you four signs of a loving church, how you and I carry out the love ethic of Jesus here in God's church. Now, Christ calls us to love our neighbors and our enemies, but it begins among us when we love each other. Very briefly, four signs of a loving church. There are more, but today I have four. And as a reference, you can refer to Romans 14 and Romans 15. First, a loving church does not judge people. That's God's domain. None of us are perfect. At best, all of us are forgiven sinners. That puts all of us on the same footing. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That is proof of God's love for us. We therefore should love others and not be so hasty in our judgment. You and I have opinions on all sorts of things. If we sat down and talked about them long enough, all the opinions we have on everything, eventually we will find, you and I, will find something to disagree on. It's true in any family. It's certainly true in any congregation. If church is divided because they couldn't agree on everything, the makeup of any given church would be a congregation of one. Only there in a congregation of one is there no disagreement, and I'm not even sure about that. I have disagreements with myself every day. The older I get, and the more set in my ways I have become, the harder it would be, I think, to be welcomed in a group of people who expect everyone to think as they think and do as they do. To paraphrase Groucho and Marx, I don't think I could be a part of any club that would accept me as one of its members. As a loving congregation, we do not judge. It's not our place. We don't use disagreements as a bludgeon to condemn. It doesn't mean anything goes. Our church has a non-smoking policy, no smoking in the church. If a worshiper comes into our church smoking marijuana and I see it, I'll take the person to the side, speak to them privately, and kindly ask them not to smoke marijuana in our church. If they continue, I'll ask our, one of our trustees to come with me, and together we will politely ask the person not to smoke marijuana in the church. If they continue, I'll ask an officer or call the police and place the misguided person under arrest and hope the person will come back to worship at a later date, minus the marijuana, but we will not judge the person. All of us stand in the need of grace. Second, we do not cause others to stumble. When I was an associate minister of a church years ago, we invited an outside speaker. We let our youth director pick the speaker, which, by the way, was the last time we asked our youth director to do that. And in the middle of the speaker's sermon, we used a color, that the person used a colorful expression, something you don't normally hear in the pulpit. I quickly glanced at the congregation, and most of them were stone-faced. Now, I knew they heard what the man said, but they more or less pretended they didn't hear that word. And I thought, well, maybe he got away with it. But then he said it again, and you could see the looks on everyone's face. The speaker had crossed a line. Some things you just don't say, some words you just don't use. The congregation didn't hear anything else the man said. And I'm sure he said some good things. He had a best-selling book on the market. But in his ignorance and foolishness, he forgot where he was and created an unnecessary stumbling block. Wisdom is knowing what those stumbling blocks are and not placing them in front of others when you don't have to, especially as a witness to God's love. Third, a loving congregation is at peace with each other. They live in harmony. They work together for a common good to build each other up and to witness the love of Christ. Years ago, I was in another church working with the committee that considers uh, people serving in a host of ministries in the church. We were looking at possible names of people to serve on a particular committee, and I suggested the names of a couple of men. The nominations committee shot looks at one another, and one of them said, Pastor, you don't want to put those two men on the same committee. 
And I said, why not? They're both very gifted. They have, a, they have a lot of talent. Together, they can do all sorts of good. One of them said, Pastor, you don't understand. We know they are both talented. But they are both alpha males. They like to lead, both of them. You put them on the same committee and everybody on that committee is going to feel like they're walking on eggs. It's not going to be good. Please, don't let's not put them on the same committee. In the end, the two served on different committees and they both did a lot of good. Peace in the valley. Harmony. When you work together, maybe not on the same committee, but as a church, the whole world knows it. You're known by your fruit. The love of Christ. Fourth and finally, a loving congregation welcomes all people. And all means all. Everybody's welcome to worship. Everyone is encouraged to participate in the ministry of Christ fully. No exceptions. In Paul's day, the question was whether or not to fully include the Gentiles who did not come from the house of David, whether or not they could fully share in the fellowship. Paul knew the spirit of Christ was in them too. They didn't have to be something they weren't. They simply needed to be loved and welcomed. That's what we do here. We love. We welcome. We include everyone and anyone. All are welcome. We don't judge. We don't cause others to stumble. We live in harmony and we welcome all. Some of the ways we are obedient to the love command. Some of the ways we love each other. Some of the ways the world comes to know whose disciples we are. How about you? Lord Jesus, like those early disciples, by your grace, help us to love each other with the same love you showed us in obedience to the one and only command you give us. For it is in your holy name we pray. Amen. Well, God bless and keep you. Be in love with one another and share your love with all. And the world will know you and whose disciple you are. Take care. God bless.